Hello, my name is Wolfram Eilenberger. I'm a German writer and philosopher, and this is part of the Hay Festival in Machino El Munda lecture series that is supported by El Pais and Sura. I'm going to talk today about my new book, which is called El Fuego de la Libertad in Spanish. In German, it's called Feuer der Freiheit, Fires of Freedom. And <clears throat> hence, we, have, we will talk about freedom what it means to be free, to be autonomous, what it means to explore yourself in a free way and even actually find your own voice. And of course, as I'm a philosopher, I try to understand what kind of philosophy, the activity of doing philosophy has, what kind of a role, what kind of importance does philosophy have to play in this process of gaining your freedom. This is actually also the topic of the book that I wrote, and that book deals with the four extraordinary human beings, individuals, in very dark times. These individuals are philosophers, female philosophers, and their main question was what it means, means to be free. Their names were Hannah Arendt, Simon Weil, Ayn Rand, and Simone de Beauvoir. And the time that they fell in when they were young and tried to gain access to their own ideas, to explore their philosophy, to become who they were destined to become, namely the most important female philosophers of the 20th century. That was a very difficult, it was a very dark time. I follow these four individuals uh, through 10 years of their early development, namely from 1933 to 1943, that is the time of the Second World War, the time of the Holocaust, the time of the totalitarian developments, both in Germany and the Soviet Union. A very, very dark time, possibly the darkest time in modern European history. And it's fascinating to see how these four very young, very brave, highly talented philosophers not only think about what it means to be free, but also experience in their everyday life what it means to lose their freedom or to be threatened uh, by other people, by the state, by the political developments. Now, as I said, we imagine philosophers usually to be very old, to have a gray beard and to be male. The individuals that I would like to focus on today are very young when they started out in philosophy. They were female and they had also a very particular way of being in the world. From early on, they felt that they are somewhat different from the others, that they did not fit in very well, neither in their classes nor in their family. And so they were strange to themselves and strange to the others. And they would ask themselves, why is that so? What, what is the pro problem with me? Why do I see the world differently? And of course, we all of, all of us have these feelings, uh, these, these moods. Uh, from one day to the other, but for them it was more of a persistent way of being in the world. And the catch with these four individuals, Hannah Arendt, Simone Weil, Ayn Rand and Simone de Beauvoir, was that they did not think of themselves as the problem to be solved, but all the other human beings. That is, they had the impression that it was not their fault, they would not fit in the right way, but it was the other's fault they were strange, they would behave erratically, irrational, they would be willing to accept things they themselves would never be able and willing to accept. So you can feel uh, in their lives and in their thinking a kind of an extreme existential pressure, a pressure that was really the fundament and the growing ground of their philosophy. And you'd also have to think that these four young human beings were in a situation in the 1930s and 40s of what I would call the threefold marginalizations. They were intellectuals, they were females, and three of them were also Jewish. And if you think of that constellation, you can imagine that their situation was in Germany, in France, in Russia, at that time, um, a very hard, a very difficult one. I would like to describe these human beings uh, as kind of diamonds. The more pressure 
was put on them, the clearer and the brighter they would shine, and the harder they would be able to think and gain their freedom. What is fascinating about these four young female philosophers was that they shared the same question. And uh, I would like to dwell a bit more on that very question because I think it's an important one, even for today. And the question is, what does it mean to be free in the face of the existence of other human beings? Philosophers tend to ask what it means to be free in very different ways and shapes. For example, I could ask myself if I'm free now to raise that hand or to lower it. I feel that I'm free to do it, but is that really so? Or is there not a causal chain from the beginning of the world, from the beginning of the world to this very moment that kind of forces me to do what I do, although I think I might do it free willingly. And this is the question of the free will. It's a very interesting question, but it's what it's not the question that the four heroes of my book, El Fuego de la Libertad, were thinking about mainly, because they thought. What does it mean to be free in respect to other human beings? And that's quite a different question. And it's a very human question because we are all thrown into the world in a world uh, where other human beings already exist. And so the question is, are the, is the existence of other human beings an enabling factor in gaining my freedom or is it an obstacle? Are the other human beings around me, the condition of the possibility of being free, or are they pressuring me and influencing so much every day that I cannot be free in face of their existence? And that is the key and the core question of these four philosophers. And just, you know, if you, if you take a moment and, and, and try to think, what are other human beings to me? And in which way do they confine or enlarge in my own freedom. Then maybe they can focus on three experiences or three constellations in our everyday life where this question becomes very important. Think, for example, of the experience of love, of loving someone else. And this is very interesting because once you feel love, once you fell in love, you also realize that you're not free anymore because your own existence has been tied up to another one's existence in a way that is limiting you in several ways. On the other hand, and this is what lovers feel, at least everyone who has fallen in love once or twice or three times in his or her life, is that once you love, you feel free for the first time. You feel freed of yourself. You feel that you are not alone in the world anymore. And for example, so was the experience of Simone de Beauvoir when she fell in love with Jean-Paul Sartre, her best partner in dialogue, the great love of her life, uh, the co-philosopher that she exchanged her thoughts with uh, her throughout her entire career and life. And she felt that I'm so alone in the world and I do not know why other people exist. And then I found this one, this one other in my life. And he, his existence gave also sense and meaning to my own existence. He virtually and actually freed myself from myself. So love and freedom are very important. And it's the same, for example, for Simone Weil, because we cannot only love other human beings. We might also feel the love of God, uh, as it was the case in Simone Weil's philosophy. And then the question is, is that an event of freedom or are we made unfree by this love of God? Are we constrained or ruled by a higher force? So love is one aspect of being free. The second one I would like to focus your attention to is um, the community or the family that we are thrown into once we are alive, because we do not cho choose the way we are thrown into the world, neither the language, nor the place, nor the time. But we come to this world, we are given a name, and usually we're given a language, and usually we're given a re religious identity or, or a creed. And those are all things that other people do for us. They do it to us. So in a very important and large sense, the very essence of our cultural existence is determined by other people. They say who we are. 
They say what we can say and cannot say. They say what is apt and unapt, what is allowed and not allowed. So if you think of the community that shapes my identity as another force, another factor in the field of being free, I think you have gained a lot of ground in understanding what it means to be free. And for example, one example in the book is, is the example of Hannah Arendt, who was born as a Jewish German woman and did not care much about her Jewish identity during her youth and during her studies. But uh, when she ended her studies and finished them by the 1930, 1931, there were also political new developments with the rise of National Socialism in Germany, which led to the fact that she had to acknowledge that other people determine who she is. She might not have thought of herself, Hannah Arendt, as being Jewish, and it might not meant a lot to her, but it meant a lot to the other human beings who decided that they know who she is and they know what is what she is about and that they know what is the core of their of her existence namely she's jewish so in that sense hannah arendt had a kind of epiphany that oh in choosing in gaining my own freedom in gaining my own autonomy i'm not alone there are other human beings who have a real say in this be it a in a positive or in this sense, a restrictive way. And I cannot just imagine myself being alone in the world and then say, oh, it is up to me to decide who I am. For example, in my religious identity, other people do that for me. And sometimes they do it to me. And it's interesting to think, for example, in present times that we think a lot about sexual identity, about gender, and the way I can choose, for example, my sexual identity freely by myself, as if it would be only up to me to do that. But in a world with other human beings, it cannot be the case. Other people will have a say in this too. So gaining your voice, gaining your identity is always a dialogical game where other people have also say in this and we cannot be so narcissistic egoistic or blind to ourselves and others to just imagine that we can choose freely who we are by ourselves because as human beings this i would claim is never the case and it's one of the big realizations of both simone de Beauvoir and hannah arendt and ayn rand that it cannot be that way that the others are always there and they have a saying in who we are the third point I would like to make in respect to the forces of the other is the state as the faceless, anonymous other. In those 10 years from 1933 to 1943, the state as the totalitarian state gained an importance and a power and a force that in, would invade every life of every citizen, be it in Germany and France, the Soviet Union, everyone felt the force of the state in his or her everyday life. And of course, one could ask oneself, who is that state? What does it have to do with my own life? Why does it, as an institution, get to decide what, can, what I can do or what I can't do? Uh, who legitimates these decisions in in the in the long run or in the in short term and of course writing this book during the corona experiences and the lockdowns uh, in my country and possibly in your country it was a very uncanny experience at least for the first time in my generation and in my country germany we felt the power of the state invading our everyday life in ways that we had never experienced before and of course, it makes you question, uh, well, who is that state? What does he want? And what kind of responsibility do I have towards that state? And what kind of power can this state legitimately exert on my own existence? So if we think of freedom, to summarize, I think we could think of the other as a, as a, as a force of love, the other in terms of identity and community and the others in terms of the state and actually 
those were the big three fields that the four heroes of my book, these fires of freedom, were thinking about during these very dark times. Now, you would ask a philosopher, so what, what is the right answer? What is the theory of freedom that is the right one? And at least in the book that I wrote, you won't be given an answer to that very question because the four answers that Simon Weil, Ayn Rand, Hannah Arendt, and Simone de Beauvoir give to the very question of what freedom means in the face of the other are radically different questions. Simone Weil gives a different question, a different, uh, give uh, those four answers that they will give are radically different answers. So the answer that Simone Weil gives is not the same uh, than the answer that Ayn Rand gives, nor is the idea of freedom of Hannah Arendt the same as the idea of Simone de Beauvoir. And this brings us back to the way that philosophy can help yourself to gain your own freedom. Because if philosophy is anything, it is related to the capacity and the will and the daring to judge for yourself when it comes to the central questions of your life. And so when reading the book, I hope you get a feeling that this, uh, those are very important questions. There might be more than one good answer to this question of freedom. And it's up to you as a grown up human being to find your own voice, to find your own judgment concerning these questions. And I hope, for example, that the philosophies of these four female philosophers can be a kind of a help, kind of a guidance in answering the question what freedom is, because it is a question that we cannot avoid right now, nor will we will be, nor will we ever be able to avoid it as long as we are humans. Thank you. Thank you.